Okay, good evening everybody. Um, before we get started, I'm going to introduce everyone, but I just wanted to mention someone who's not here tonight. This whole evening was the brainchild of Don Mancini, uh, who was supposed to host this Q&A tonight, and Don is working on a film in Canada and got um, delayed. He wasn't able to come tonight, but he said he is with us all in spirit, and I think he's very much would have loved to have been here tonight, and I hope to carry on in, in his... Uh, in his stead. Um, my name is Ray Morton. I'm the author of King Kong, the history of a movie icon, which covered this film and all the other King Kong films. And I'd like to introduce everybody who's up on the panel here tonight. Down at the end, we have Jack O'Halloran, who played Joe Perko in the film. And next to Jack, we have the director of photography of the film, Richard H. Klein. Next, we have Rick Baker. The <laughs> designer and Kong performer. Um, next, we have Martha DeLorenis. <laughs> and Richard Kraft, who worked with John Barry. So the film we just saw is, is kind of a significant one for a number of reasons. Um, at the time, it was the most expensive film ever made. It was the most expensive independent production ever made. It was the widest released film of all time up until that time, 1,200 theaters. Uh, at, you know, nowadays, that's nothing, but that was huge in those days. Um, it's the last, it's kind of a hybrid film. It's uh, the last of the old time studio special effects pictures using traditional effects like uh, split screen and um, uh, handmade <laughs> optical effects, non-computerized effects, uh, folks in ape suits, things like that. Star Wars came along six months later and that introduced the whole motion control computer effects era. Um, and then of course that's morphed into the CGI era now. This was the last of the old time and the first of the new time. It was the first, uh, first film to really bring in mechanical makeup effects to create creatures. And along with Jaws, it was the first movie to use a full-scale mechanical version of its monster to present the creature. So um, last of the old, first of the new. Um, the film was the brainchild of its producer, Dino De Laurentiis. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to start off uh, asking Martha, what was Dino's <laughs> ideas about this film? First of all, I came into the picture with Dino a, a few years after King Kong was made. So um, I am not involved in the show except for, thank you, Jack, Richard, Rick, and Richard and, and Roy uh, Ren, um, for coming tonight and, and making this special. Uh, Dino, um, he was always about the big picture. You know, whatever was epic and challenging, he would just go for. And that's what um, he, I think he taught and exemplified around everyone. And actually, I was reading um, one, of the, one of your books about uh, the, the making of, and it was just fascinating how you captured really so much of, of uh, I think, what everyone contributed. But, but certainly his, his, um, his stature or his, or his just directness, I mean, he, uh, he didn't mince words. He was um, he knew what he wanted, and he challenged everybody to get what you know what was the top of their game. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think what um, Dino was challenged with by Barry Diller with Paramount at that time was Barry wanted to have his monster movie. Universal had their monster movies. Uh, Fox had their monster movies. Paramount wanted a monster movie, and it was actually his daughter Francesca, uh, whose kids are here tonight. And they've never seen it on the big screen. They've seen it on oh. a VCR, but great, so great. it's pretty special. Um, and Francesca had a King Kong poster in her room. And so he would, you know, obviously, you know, saying um, uh, good morning to her every morning before she went to school. He saw the poster of King Kong. He says, that's it. <laughs> so he went to Barry Diller, and they made the deal that day. But the rest is, is your history to talk about. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Klein, you worked with Dino on several films. Uh, what was your impression of him as a producer? He was a, uh, uh, Dino was one of the, not only a kind man, and a, a man with um, vision, but he really was, a, w w nothing stopped him. Uh, 
there was just nobody like Dino, and uh, I, I just without without him, perhaps this film could not have been made. And uh, he 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 was the the engine of the film. He was there throughout the making of the film, uh, present there, uh, c covering up any areas that had to be rectified. He did it brilliantly, gently, a very colorful man with a sense of humor and a lovely family. Richard, you said on the uh, opening night of filming, Dino said something to you. He uh, challenged you to earn something, uh, if you recall. Um, do you remember what that was? He said he wanted you to earn something for the film. Uh, no, no I, I, I... He said, think Oscar. Huh? What? He said, think Oscar. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, and yeah, you ended up getting an Oscar nomination for this film for your work on it. So you you did what he asked. He did. He did it. Forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. The film um, was written by I think Michael mentioned this earlier, Lorenzo Semple Jr. And he and Dino had just worked together. Lorenzo had created the Batman TV series and uh, then moved into screenwriting with movies like Pretty Poison and Papillon and The Parallax View. He and Dino had just worked on Three Days of the Condor um, for right before this film, and I, I believe that's how they got involved with this together. Um, they came up with a different approach. They didn't want to remake the original film specifically, and Lorenzo told me at one point, we wanted to make everything different. That way the purist wouldn't slam us for copying the original film. So they made everything different and they got slammed for not making it like the original <laughs> film. So that's how that went. Um, the original screenplay ended at the Empire State Building, just like the original film. It ended up uh, being set on the World Trade Center because Paramount took out an ad announcing the film uh, by, with some wonderful illustrations by an artist named John Berkey and you'll see some of those out in the lobby with the great display that Jim Avey brought us today. And uh, one of the executives at Paramount said, just, they were doing uh, comps for the, the thing on the World, uh, the Empire State Building, and the executive said, just try one on the World Trade Center, because it had just opened, and the ad looked so good that the next draft of the script was set at the World Trade Center. So that's how that happened. Um, the first director they approached was Roman Polanski, and the, the quote that I heard was, he said, I don't know what to do with the monkey. <laughs> so then Dino approached John Gillerman, who ended up directing the film, who had directed The Towering Inferno right before, and he was working for Dino on a different project, and Dino asked John, do you know what to do with the monkey? And John's reply was apparently, yes, I know what to do with the monkey. So that's how he got the job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that was his audition. Um, Richard, I'm going to start with you. Can you talk about what it was like to work with John Gillerman on the film? John Gillerman? What was it like to work with him on the film? Uh, it's been 40 years <laughs> since we did the film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, back, yeah. But you so give me a chance here. Sure, okay. sure, sure. <laughs> but I, I must say, uh, the organization was unbelievable. Uh, Every individual was a talent, avant-garde, uh, made it possible to do things that were done for the first time, and they're still being done today if they could be afforded. <laughs> but uh, it, it really was a collection of, uh, of uh, again, uh, and people that wanted this film to be the greatest. And we all felt that way and uh, inspired by Dino, particularly. And uh, John Gillerman did a sensational job in, in organizing and, uh, and, and, and fighting for everything that he needed. Not, not a literal fight, in other words, asking for everything he needed and he did get. Dino saw to it that he got it. Rick, what was it like for you to work with John? Hello? Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, John was fine with me. He was good. I mean, that's one of the reason I actually got the part is because uh, John liked, you know, the, let me step back. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
I first heard uh, from John Landis that some Italian guy was going to remake King Kong. And I just shook my head and I said, they're going to get some idiot and put him in an ape suit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was right. You know, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, to me it was sacrilege. I mean, the original King Kong is a great film, you know. And it, it, groundbreaking effects, and beautiful, you know, beautifully done. Um, but then somehow they found out that I made ape suits and I got a call to come in and talk to them. And so I went in uh, uh, with a little sculpture I did of a, of a gorilla from the uh, LA Zoo that I did at the zoo. And, uh, these mechanical arm extensions that my friend John Berg made, and John came with me, and I had an ape head, and and they kind of said, you know, well, we really don't, our, our we're not going to make that King Kong, you know, we're we're making a new version. It's a disaster movie. It was in the age of disaster movies, mm -hmm. so, and, you know, hence John Gilman is a director, um, and their original thinking was Kong was going to be more of an ape man, and they had these drawings that Minter Hubner did of these primitive men, some even kind of Neanderthal-like, and I was going, what the hell's wrong with you, man? I'm 25 years old, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going in there going, what the hell's wrong with you guys? You can't make Kong an ape man. If anything, it should be a gorilla on steroids. It shouldn't be, you know, more in the man's kind of thing. And they said, well, this is what we're going to do, you know. Anyways, they, it came down to, um, I said, well, I'd be willing to work on this, you know, but I've got another job offer. And uh, I really need to know because I've kind of said I would do this other film, but I, you know, I, you know, Kong, like you said, it was a big movie. I basically done low budget independent films that were shot in a few days, you know, with the exception of working on The Exorcist with Dick Smith, you know, and, um, and they said, well, well, we'll we'll get back to you, you know. Well, they didn't get back to me, so I took the other film. Mm -hmm. Then they got back to me, and <laughs> I said, you know, I'm doing this other film, film called Squirm. I don't know if any of you guys seen that film. <laughs> And I said, well, what I can probably do is get the, uh, make the effects, teach somebody to put them on, and then I could come on to Kong. You know? So I did that. When I came on to Kong, they said, well, it, you know, since you weren't around, we've actually, Dino brought his friend from Italy, Carlo Rombaldi, mm -hmm. and we're not thinking we might not even need a whole ape suit because Carlo says he can build a 40-foot robot that can do the whole movie. <laughs> And I said, you guys are crazy. You know? <laughs> Again, 25 years old. You know? uh, there's no way he's going to build a 40-foot robot that's going to be able to do what a guy in a suit can do. You know? And uh, they said, well, yeah, we, we still want to do a suit as a backup thing. You know? and, and what we want to do, and, and, but we want you to work with Carlo. And I said, I, I don't know who this guy is. Does he speak English? No. You know, I don't speak Italian. You know, how's this going to work? You know, we have very different ways of doing things. You know? and, and they said, well, what we want you to do is do a test suit. You guys are both going to do test suits, and you're going to have like six weeks to build a suit. And then you're going to meet back, and we're going to look and compare notes. You know? So I said, OK. So I, I went in my garage, and, and they had one assistant. And on the weekends, I had Rob Botin, who was my child protege, and would come and work for free on it. And, and I built this. I, you know, They gave me the drawings of these eight men, which I threw away. <laughs> and I said. <laughs> I'll show them that I know more about what King Kong should be than what they do, you know. 25-year-old smart kid, you know. So. Uh, so I built this gorilla suit uh, in six weeks. And uh, it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad, you know. And, and it had some things that this Kong didn't have, which, you know, I had a self-contained head uh, where I could operate the face myself with my own jaw movements and stuff. So anyways, I mean, I show up on the day that we're supposed to meet to compare suits, and they, when they saw my suit, they were like pissed off, you know. They went, this doesn't look anything like what we asked you to build, you know. And, and it's like, yeah, I know, it's better, <laughs> you know. This is, this, is, this is what King Kong should be, you know. And they, and, and they said, well, but th th this isn't what we asked you to do. They were really mad, you know. And I go, well, Carlo's suit probably was, looks more like what you wanted it to be, and they said, well, he hasn't, he hasn't built his, he didn't have time to finish it, you know, and I went, well, I didn't have time to finish mine either, but I got it done, you know, and, and they go, well, he's working on the big robot, which is really gonna be the whole movie, you know. So they said, you know, they regrettably, like, did some tests with my suit, because that's the only thing they had, 
and because I built the suit to fit myself, you know, they got used to the performance that I was doing. Also during the time when I was doing Squirm, they hired two actors um, to play Kong. After they did a horrible thing, which was first they put a, a an ad in the trades looking for a, a black person to play a gorilla in this movie, and it caused a big outrage of things. You know. uh, but they hired this guy named Albert Popwell uh, and another guy named Hampton Fancher to to play King Kong. Mm. And during the time I was building my test suit, they uh, were going to the San Diego Zoo and studying gorillas. And Hampton was actually quite good, I thought. You know, but uh, Carlo eventually got his suit done, which he had built for. Um, uh, Albert Popwell, and they called me and they said, "Carlos, suit's finally done. You know, come, we're gonna come look at it." And it was basically a disaster. And you know, Gillerman said, "You know, Rick, Rick was right. His suit is much more what Kong should be." You know, so they said Rick, "Put your suit on." And I went. I left my suit at home. They got, they got a driver, took me home to North Hollywood, back out to MGM, put the suit on, and and John was going. Yes, this is much better. This is much more what it should be, and I want Rick to play Kong because they got used to me hopping around on the ape suit. You okay. know, so that that was a really long answer. I'm sorry, about that. <laughs> 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 but it was your performance that was so great, and the expression in your eyes that I remember. That's what Dino would always recount, even though you know he loved Carlo. But it was it was your the expression and what you captured with with the, the facial. Articulation. That was terrific. You had to coordinate with the, the folks running the masks, right? There were five masks, I believe? No, well, I, I made them. I, okay. I, the other thing that happened, so I mean, on that day, again, being the smart ass 25 year old, when, when John said, you know, I want Rick to do it, you know, that, and I said, you know what, I quit. I, you know, I busted my butt to make this ape suit, and then I got nothing but, you know, grief from you guys. I found out that Carlo had a workshop with like 30 people in it, and a hell of a lot more money. He couldn't get his suit done, and he failed. You know, so I said, you know, you know what? I'm done with this. You know, and then Jack Roseberg, the uh, production manager, had a nice talk with me and explained that I'll never work in Hollywood again if I, <laughs> if I quit, you know, and, and, and I said, well, how's it going to work? You know, he, we have very different techniques, we use different materials, we don't speak the same language, you don't want two bosses on something like this, we're just going to get in each other's way, you know, and, you know, then Dino called us into his office, and, you know, what was great about Dino, what was really nice is that, unlike movies these days, you know, Dino was the producer. And if you needed to talk to the producer, you go to the producer's office, and he was there. There wasn't 25 producers who, who, who you know, he, he was the man that you talked to, you know. And being the, you know, the kid who thought he knew more than anybody else at the time, you know, I'd go into Dino's office and go, why are you wasting this money on this big fucking robot that's not going to work, you know? <laughs> give me the money for the suit, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and he didn't listen to that part, you know? But, but he was smart. I mean, you know, it sounds much better. The publicity was all about a 40-foot robot being in, the, in the, this movie. It sounds a lot better than, like, some 25-year-old schmuck in a gorilla suit, you know? So. <laughs> But I, um, but then it's like, who's going to sculpt it? You know, and they go, you know, and Dino calls us in the office, and again after my Jack Grossberg meeting, and he said, you know, I got the best guy from Italy, I got the best guy from America. Together, you guys are going to make the best gorilla suit ever. You know, and it's like, who's going to sculpt it? You know, well, we think you're both good. You know, why don't you both sculpt heads, and and then we'll see. You know, so they got me actually in the sculptors union because I wasn't in the union, the sculptors and mold makers union. So then I worked on the MGM lot, and, and Carlo had a, this big studio next to the staff shop at MGM, again, full of people. And I like kind of working in a room by myself. So I, I said, can I, the makeup department, they, there was a makeup department there that was now defunct. You know, it was this dilapidated building, but it still had work tables and stuff. And I go, I want to work in there. So I sculpted three heads. Carlo, Carlo sculpted one. We brought him to Dino's office, and uh, they chose my head. And... Uh, so I, so the, I, I made the head, you know, I wanted to make the molds, but they wouldn't let me make the molds, even though the sculptors and the mold makers are the same union. So I, I had to deal with the union mold makers who didn't understand what kind of plasters I wanted to use and 
and how I wanted to do it. And it was kind of, you know, kind of a frustrating experience, but I ran the foam, I painted the heads, I put the hair on the heads, I sculpted the body, the hands, the feet were modeled after the hands and feet that I made for my test suit. I supervised the sculpture of the big hands, the big hands, which were great, which were built by Glenn Robinson yes. and Eddie, Eddie Serkin. Um, those things worked really well. I forgot how good they were. Mm -hmm. I've seen the movie again for the first time in a long time. They were really quite nice. You know? um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I, my special contributions were, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> were those things besides being the idiot in the ape suit. But there was also another, th another guy. Uh, I mean, I knew that having built and worn ape suits before that how hard it was going to be. And this was a long, hard shoot, and so much stuff was blue screen. And this is in the photochemical, you know, compositing days. So, you know, the, you know, the blue screens were lit with these 10Ks or whatever they were, you know, tons of them. And it was hot as hell. I had a gorilla suit on, you know, six inches thick with bear fur on it, you know. And I said, you know, I want to, I think we should do tag team gorillas. You know, I, you find somebody my size. So when I can't do it anymore, uh, he can take over, you know, I'll tag him, you know, tap out and he'll come in. Uh, so we found this guy named Bill Shepard and uh, the, he fit in the suit basically. And, and what happened though is Bill, uh, John Gillerman said, I can see the difference, I want Rick to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And Bill became more of the stunt double guy. He did the, the climbing of the, the Trade Center on wires. Anything on wires was Bill. Bill fell in the pit. Uh, the snake fight, when it, when towards the end of production, when we were running out of time, they had a couple of units going, so they decided that Bill, I, I led up to the snake fight, and then Bill was rolling around on the ground and ripped the snake's head when I was doing the, uh, inside the uh, super tanker stuff. Uh, okay. Um, but he was like the tag team, you know, you know stunt gorilla guy. Right. <laughs> and every performance you had was on the miniature stage, right? So basically, no, I didn't go to location. I was on a miniature stage or on a blue screen stage. Uh, you know, a lot of blue screen stuff and and a lot of stuff where, you know, like I'm like this with this arm hidden because the big arm was going to be composited in here with Jessica in it. So I'm just kind of looking at nothing and, you know, doing my thing, you know, and or then uh, jumping around in a not very well made miniature set. <laughs> yeah. And there was a team of folks operating the actual expressions, right? Yeah, the, uh, oh, Carlo's real uh, contribution to the, to the suit was the, the mechanical head, um, which was basically, it was really Isadora Raponi who, who was the one who built it. Uh, and it was cable operated. And I had a bundle of cables that came out the back of the head about this big, you know, like bicycle cables, but they were like 40 feet long. And they came out the head, we either come out the back of my, uh, back if, it, if we were just framing like this, which a lot of the shots were. And if I was walking and you could see the full figure, it actually came out my feet. So I had to drag these cables along. And on the other end of the cables were three operators. Carlo was one, Isadora Raponi, and another guy was one of the tailors who actually helped sew the suit together. Okay. And they uh, would pull these big levers that would work my face. Um, and it was tough at, because the just the weight of the cables would pull my head back like this, so it was really hard to, we actually ended up like kind of tying them off, but there was a lot of times where I was walking along through the jungle in the stupid biped ape walk. You know, I mean, I wanted to do, I wanted to, you know, I thought this was gonna be my only opportunity to build a gorilla suit, and I wanted to make the ultimate gorilla costume and be do a real performance and stand quadruped, and, and which they didn't want, you know. But, but, you know, I'd be walking along through the jungle like this, and all of a sudden my, cable would get caught on a tree and I'd go like <laughs> like this you know because I'd pull my head back you know so so there's got to be daily somewhere of that you know <laughs> the idiot and the apes are doing this you know so. the um the robot actually started as um a puppet the uh John Gillerman had requested some full-size images uh, you know a full-size representation of Kong for certain shots and I think that's why they brought Carlo over, I believe, because he had an expertise in building puppets. He did the little puppets for um, Barbarella and a bunch of other films. And somewhere in there, it went from being essentially a puppet or a marionette. I think it was Jaws had come out, and somewhere the idea became, let's do a big mechanical thing, because the Jaws shark had gotten so much promotion. And uh, what's kind of wonderful is if you look at some of the storyboards, 
they were really ambitious about what they were going to use it for. It's, it's plotted into a lot of the storyboards. But Carlo had come up with a design that uh, apparently was going to take like three years to build and cost many, many millions of dollars. So they came up with a simpler version. Glenn Robinson, the, the, visual, uh, the special effects guy, came up with something based on amusement park rides. And it just um, it didn't quite work, I guess, as they had hoped. It took a long time to build. And ultimately, it's only in the movie for a few shots. Six. Six, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was counting when I was watching them. <laughs> they're, they're about, they're, and they're like two seconds long. Yeah. You know? But worth his weight in publicity, I think. Oh, yeah, I think it was, yeah. too. Yeah. And Richard Klein, you were, you were there the night they shot the King Kong robot coming out of the gas tank, correct? And you said that was a <laughs> an interesting experience. In other words, with the helicopter lifted. And yes, the, yeah. The, uh, oh, sorry, the mic. Thank you. <laughs> I, want, I want to, you've uh, refreshed, what, your, what you've just said a moment ago, uh, you refresh my memory of all the craziness that, I'll call it craziness, but uh, organized craziness uh, that made it, helped make this film. Nobody backed off. Uh, they, I don't mean in argumentative terms, in meaning achieving a first in so many areas of um, that, that, that uh, this film touched. As you can see, uh, the variety of sets, the coordination of extras, people, uh, flawless, really was. And uh, you cited it so, so very well. And, but one complimentary thing, the the fault, the eyes you had to uh, the the, the um, lenses, lenses, right? Yeah. They were so painful, and he really was a yeoman's duty in wearing those uh, those opticals to make his eyes look like a, a gorilla's eyes would be an ape rather would be rather than just a normal person, and that really made the difference. But, but terribly painful, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I, I suggested the lenses because I thought even on a subconscious level, you know, if you had human eyes looking out, you wouldn't just, you would feel the human and not that you didn't, it didn't, I mean, it looked like a man in a suit anyways, you know, <laughs> uh, with a pretty awful performance, but, but uh, the problem, you know, what happened, this is in the days when they were hard contact lenses and they're scleral contacts, which was full eye contacts. It was made out of a hard plastic and what I'd have to do is pull my lid down, I'd shove it up under my upper lid, and then pull my lower lid down, and it would pop, you know, it would be held in my eye, um, by my eyelids. And what happens when I first put them on, again, this was my idea, you know, I put them on, and you know, they said you're only supposed to wear them for like 20 minutes at a time, you know, I said, well, that's not real practical, but after about 10 minutes, my eyes would burn like, I had like hot coals in my eyes, and, I ended up going to the guy who made the lenses, and I said, you know, listen, the, these, I, if, after 10 minutes, I'm in excruciating pain, you know. And he said, you know, you actors are all such pussies, you know. And I said, <laughs> you know, I said, first of all, this was my idea. I want these lenses. I want it to work. I was the one, the reason that we even made these, you know. But they, I, the something is wrong, you know. And he just, like, blew me off. So I went to a different optometrist. And he knew right away. He said, it's the lack of oxygen. Your, your eyes are sensitive to the fact that they're not getting any oxygen. And he says, what we have to do is fence straight the lens. And I went, what the hell does that mean? And he goes, we're going to drill a hole in it. You know? so, okay. so they drilled a hole in the lens up, up towards the top. Because the lenses were also, I had to fill it with a saline solution. They, they didn't actually touch the cornea of my lens. So the saline would bridge the, the distance between the cornea of my eye and the lens itself so I could see. So once he fenestrated the lens and, uh, and put a hole in it, I, I had no problem with whatsoever with it. I mean, they hurt still, but I would put them on in the morning with the suit. I mean, this was the daily routine. I'd come in in the morning, put the lenses in, put the suit on, and usually sit around for four hours completely dressed as a gorilla <laughs> with these lenses while well, you know, we're waiting for the shots to be set up. You know? and <laughs> but I would take them off at lunch, and then I would put them on again after lunch and wear them all day until the end of the day, and I was able to do that after that. But I would drive home. I'm surprised I didn't get in an accident. I would drive myself home from MGM in Culver City to North Hollywood in a fog. I couldn't see. Everything, it was just, had a halo around it. Everything was foggy. 
when I'd get up in the morning, I couldn't open my eyes because they would be crusted shut. I'd have to get hot compresses and put them on and get the uh, tried up mucusy crap that was on my <laughs> eye off. You know, it was it was pretty bad. You know? <laughs> I, I also would I would lose five pounds a day in water weight. You know, I I I would I weighed myself because I was curious. You know, and, <laughs> and I, I would take the feet off and you could fill up a, a styrofoam coffee cup with the sweat from my you know from my feet. You know. <laughs> I accidentally drank it once. It was, it was a <laughs> <laughs> you get thirsty, you know. <laughs> Didn't you end up breaking a collarbone at some point? You know, I, I had a few injuries. Mo mostly were on my face, you know, because the, the mask would, like, rub and, and wear out. You know, I'd have, like, blisters on my face and get scratches from the mechanism. But there was... Um, you know, the helicopters, we, we did a couple interesting things. Uh, we went out to Sam Air Force Base, I forget which one it was, and, and they shot real helicopters, and they built this, you know, big scaffolding, and they said, we want you to put the suit on, climb up on the scaffolding, and these helicopters are going to come at you, and they had a split diopter lens, uh, so it could focus on me and focus on the helicopters. And I went, I can't climb the scaffolding with the suit on, you know, so I had to climb the scaffolding, take my clothes off on the top of this scaffolding, put the suit on, and then stand on another platform while these real helicopters are coming, shooting blanks. And I at least had all this foam rubber and, and fur on, and the crew was getting pelted with the, the ejected shells from the thing, and they're all, they're all screaming and yelling, and I was, I was kind of laughing. You know? but, <laughs> but the other thing was they had miniature helicopters on the stage, and, you know, they built the top of the World Trade Center. Um, <clears throat> and I was pretty much anchored to it because the cables came up through holes in the set. And I remember having a horrible cold and being feeling miserable in this ape head with, my, with snot running out of my nose and down on my lips and over my chin and eventually coming out my neck, you know, and I could do nothing about it, you know. But, but anyways, they had these uh, remote-controlled helicopters that were... Uh, mounted from up the the uh, permanence up there, and uh, someone had laid a two by four across one of the permanent things and didn't anchor it down, and the helicopters uh, made it broke it loose, and I'm there, you know, doing my ape thing, and and all of a sudden I got hit with something really hard, and I thought one of the helicopters fell, and then I, uh, fortunately, I had. A lot of padding on it and it hurt but uh, many years later when I went and was complaining about shoulder problems um, they did an x-ray and they said when did you break your collarbone and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know and I said, that's the only thing I could figure was that and it was on that side <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. the cast obviously of the film um, was pretty great uh, Jeff Bridges obviously he was uh, coming off a couple of Oscar nominations at that point um, the, cat, the part was originally offered to Chris Sarandon, but he turned it down, so Jeff came in. Uh, Charles Grodin obviously played Fred. He was a little controversial, apparently. My understanding is Barry Diller thought he was too funny or something. But I, yeah, yeah, he was, he was, he was terrific. Um, it's obviously Jessica Lange's first film. Uh, originally, I guess there was talk of uh, Barbara Streisand playing the part. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then they ended up um, making an offer, I think, to Deborah Raffin, and they were pretty much close to going with that when um, Jessica came to their attention. She was a model at the time. And then, uh, Richard, I believe you shot her screen test, right? Yeah. Jessica, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yes, yeah. And the, the great quote I heard from John Gillerman was that when he saw her test projected in the screening room, he yelled out, I found my Fay Ray. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, the supporting cast is a terrific group. John Randolph, very famous character actor, Rene Aubergenois, uh, Julius Harris, and Jack down at the end here was Joe Perko. The it was a great cast. I mean, it was a great, great bunch of people to work with. It was a great cast. And Jessica was brilliant for a person doing her first picture. She was, uh, she was just an outstanding, and just a lovely lady. She was just a wonderful person. You know, we had a lot of fun, all of us, because we were on the picture a long time. And it, uh, but it worked out very well. I mean, when you stop and think, it, you're looking, you're watching this, the, the picture, and what this gentleman here did, that was magic. You know, we're, we, come out of, we come out of a fog in Zuma Beach, 
and landed on <laughs> we landed in in Kauai, in Kauai on the beach, but we, we we actually shot the fog in Zuma Beach in Malibu because they couldn't. The weather, John kept thinking he could get it and kept blowing it out and blowing it out. And Dino was such a perfectionist that we wound up coming back here and shooting it over there. And then you, you're looking at us in Kauai up in the mountain, and then when the walls up, we're at the back lot of MGM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, so it worked out really, I mean, all of us had a great time. Charlie Groden's a funny guy. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie was, Charlie. On and off, I think, the screen. Um, yeah, the shooting began in San Pedro and then moved to, I think it was off Catalina for a while, Richard, you shot, and then, um, then went to Hawaii, and it was your suggestion to do Hawaii, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, especially the Nepali coast. I knew, I knew. I knew of the uh, loca uh, location that we talked about in meetings. I knew it existed over there, and because I shot a commercial over there, and we went directly to it, and they all agreed that yes, this is it with the the cave. Um, yeah, yeah. It it was just it was fantasy, and it it was just perfect, and uh, we shot there for quite a while. Okay. We shot in that volcano when there was the, 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 when we shot inside the volcano there. Yeah, yeah. The vegetation has, still hasn't grown back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Jack, didn't you tell me a little earlier that there were some um, visitors to the set when you were shooting in the volcano? Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see, imagine imagine going in, you're you're on a, a movie set in Kauai, and and here's this poor couple that was on the wedding. Do you remember that? They were on their, their reception. I mean, their honeymoon. And they they were camping out on the uh, on the beach over there, and they wake up to a movie a movie crew. <laughs> you know, all these all these helicopters are landing and all this stuff. And then we're sitting down, and they fly in lunch, and all of a sudden, all these people appear out of nowhere. I say, Wow, where do these people come from? They were growing marijuana over in the mountain. And I said, Wow, man. I said, You know. You, how come you guys, hey, well, we have it all camouflaged. He said, nobody can, choppers fly by and they don't see us and we've been here for, so I said to this guy, where, where are you from, man? He said, Seattle, Washington. I said, wow, I said, how long have you been here? He said, uh, what year is it? <laughs> <laughs> but they, the box lunches, they went crazy over there. We were giving pounds of, <laughs> pounds of wheat away for a box lunch, you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the stage work was done at MGM, which is now Sony down in Culver City, and I think some work at the Culver Studios also. Uh, I think the World Trade Center was at the Culver Studios. And then the unit traveled to New York City and shot at the actual World Trade Center. Um, and the there was a shot, Richard, you told me about that you needed to get looking straight down into the plaza of the World Trade Center. Um, can you tell the folks how you had to get that shot, what you had to climb out on? Yeah, the World, the world uh, Trade Center, which is 110 stories, mm -hmm. we were working off the roof, and we had to get a, a shot of uh, Kong, or I should say the, the, the background that we would composite on the set of, uh, of, of our Kong climbing up. And uh, to, to get the shot straight down, I had to get out on a six foot plank and uh, shoot straight down. I was out there for a couple of hours at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, it was, for me, it was very daring. <laughs> and I think for anybody. For anybody, it, yeah. It <laughs> <been, I think. laughs> <laughs> and he suffers from vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> but you said um, that there's no picture of you doing that. What, why was that? You said there's no picture of you out on that plank because the unit photographer wasn't oh, going to oh, go anywhere. Oh, you're right. Um, we, we, in those days, we didn't really have a, a still photographer with small cameras, uh, 35. And so we w I wanted to get a picture of myself out there. I thought it would be good for the our camera magazines to show what we do. Could have been your last picture too. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> but anyway, he disappeared, and uh, we 
nobody with a camera, so we never got a picture of myself out there on the six foot plank shooting straight down 110 stories. And uh, at night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I gotta say that if Kong even looks halfway decent in this film, which I don't even think he does, but it's because he did a great job of lighting it. He, there was a lot of things, that, there were a lot of problems with that suit that he did a great job of covering up, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he was a real ally on this film, and I, and I was really excited. The main reason I came tonight, because I wanted to see Dick Klein again. You know, so yeah. I, That's the exact yeah. reason why I'm here. I wanted to see this gentleman again. When you start thinking, we did the log scene, it was the very last scene that they shot in the movie. And then we shot at MGM on the Esther Williams swimming pool there. So you're here you are in Kauai, and the next minute you're standing on the log, it looked like that we're in Kauai still. Right. This is this gentleman's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It, as you all know, it was a very ambitious film. <laughs> Kong in the final scene is played by a big styrofoam mannequin of Kong. Uh, which was made from the same moles that they created the robot from. Um, 3,000 people turned out for filming uh, for a couple of those crowd scenes. And if you can see in the end, there's some barricades that kind of keep them a little bit away from Kong. And apparently one night they just all decided they had enough and they were going to rush the barricades. And as uh, one of the assistant directors said, they mugged Kong. Um, they stole his eye, they stole his finger, they stole a lot of his fur. The next night, um, I think they weren't allowed to have 30,000 people. They had a small crew and finished the shoot without anyone mugging Kong again. Um, yeah, well, they the filmed. Close -ups, the close ups they did uh, at the end, which uh, again, Dick Klein's brilliance here, mm -hmm. when I was dying and they had a shot of me lying on the, on the set, which I was a little afraid because they had a, a big 35 millimeter camera right over my head like this. And I was thinking, I hope this thing doesn't fall on me, you know? <laughs> but he did a really cool thing when I'm supposed to die. Uh, it, he turned off the eye highlight on my eye, so you know, it starts to fade and it just eventually goes, and it just really made it seem like he was dying. I think another, another great thing that Dick Klein did. You know. great. <laughs> the film was um, edited by Ralph Winters, who edited uh, Ben-Hur, among many, many, many other films, and the, the optical work was done by Frank Vandeveer, who was very famous uh, for his work, and he was assisted by a wonderful guy named Barry Nolan, who sends his love to everybody. He couldn't be here tonight, but he really wanted to be. Um, and as the film was finishing, obviously one of the great parts of this movie is the wonderful, wonderful score by John Barry. Um, and Richard, you worked with John Barry for many years, right? So could you, yeah. Yeah, I, I um, was a giant film music nerd soundtrack collector growing up in Bakersfield. <laughs> And I would go to Goodwill and buy anything that said the word soundtrack. And because they were a nickel and I would take a risk, even though I never heard of the movies. And I noticed the ones that, that said composed by John Barry sounded better than the ones composed by other people. So I became kind of an obsessive fan of John's. And after King Kong, I became his agent and got to know him pretty well. And it was interesting doing a little research of his involvement in this film. Uh, the 1960s were all about John Barry, the James Bond movies, Born Free, Lion in Winter, and then the 70s was a odd uh, period for him, and a few other composers who were really big in the 60s had a weird transfer over to the 70s where uh, John Williams started dominating the field, and with the exception of King Kong, most of John Barry's contributions to the 70s was doing the wrong version of movies. Instead of doing Jaws, he would do The Deep. Instead of doing uh, Enter the Dragon, he would do D Game of Death. Instead of doing Star Wars, he would do Star Crash. So he was like this big composer and frequently kind of slumming it on movies in the 70s. And then had enormous rebirth in the 80s, starting with Somewhere in Time and Body Heat and then Out of Africa and Dances with Wolves. But this movie was the kind of highlight of the 70s for him, but it was also a big challenge because the movie was never finished. It was never, John Barry somebody who scores a movie by looking at it and having an emotional reaction to it. And he's not much of a technical composer. He's, he's very much about 
connecting to the emotion and quite frequently imposing an emotion on something. This movie is like a combination of lyrical romanticism and kind of dread and doom and foreboding. And that was hard for him because he didn't have a film. So he scored the movie actually as, the movie was given to him sort of in chronological order. So he's scoring the movie, the beginning of the movie with no sense of what the feeling of later in the movie would be. He would just keep finding his way. And I've read interviews with him where he said what a challenge it was. And I can relate, later we had a similar experience on a different movie. Uh, Many years later, he was given a movie and it was an animated movie. And he was really frustrated because he could never see the film. He would get sections of the film and his brain didn't think, oh, here's three minutes of footage. Let me just put some music on it. He needed to know what the heart of it was. And by then, he was at a point where if he was frustrated, he would quit the film. And that movie ended up being The Incredibles, which was a real heartbreak, because I kept saying, stick around. It's all going to work out. Just wait till you see the whole movie. And he's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. There's pencil drawings. I don't know how to give heart to a pencil drawing. And... um, The other thing about King Kong, very few people realize these are my co-stars because I'm in the movie. I played extra 385 guy in red shirt standing next to yellow balloon at Shea Stadium. And thank you, thank you. And uh, the way that came about is the LA Times, there was an ad looking for extras. Uh, And it was like, I'm in Bakersfield. It's like, I can be in the movies. And I sent off and they sent tickets. I think they shot over three nights. And I was there the night where the tank comes out and is lifted up. And they had one of those guys who, if you ever go to a taping of like a sitcom, has lots of energy and is trying to get everyone all excited. He goes, okay, you're about to see the most amazing thing, this 40-foot robot of King Kong. So the tanker starts lifting up and halfway up to its knees, it stops. And so we're standing around for a few hours waiting for them to figure out. Now the tension's really there. We saw King Kong's feet, which at that time looked pretty good. The feet were great. And then it starts lifting up, lifting up, and that crowd saw Kong robot and burst into laughter. (laughs) (laughs) And, And I was like 16 years old, and I'm thinking, I've been reading all about how this giant robot's gonna star in the entire movie. And the six shots of him in the movie, it's like, if you did not know the backstory, you would go, why does Khan keep morphing into a giant robot, basically? Uh, So, um, yeah. John Barry agent and star of King Kong. <laughs> you know, funny, funny thing about the big robot. You know, it, it it wasn't done until right at the end, and that was when they had, you know, all the publicity, the world come out. It was this big, this big deal. You know, and they would shoot because it was on the back lot at MGM, which doesn't exist anymore now. as a housing development. They could only film. They, we did half, half the night with the crowds, and then we'd go to the stage, and then I would do my thing on the miniature set. You know, and and when I'm breaking out of the cage, the first take I did, I had pieces of the cage and I slammed them on the ground and they went, no, no, you can't do that. And I go, what do you mean I can't do that? And I go, that's, I think that's what Kong would do. And he goes, no, we shot the big Kong with the cages in his hand and he kind of went like this, you know? <laughs> so, so like I'm like doing this stuff and then I kind of put it down and just kind of, then I cut to the big Kong going like that, you know? But, but what happened is, uh, I think the only reason I even got a credit on this film was there was one day, I mean, again, sitting totally, suited up in my ape suit with the scleral contact lenses on, and John Gillerman comes over to me and he goes, uh, time, there's a reporter from Time Magazine here, and uh, he's gonna do an article on Kong, but we don't want him to know that you're, it's actually you in the suit you know, playing King Kong. So if he asks you what you're doing, you know, don't tell him, and I go, John, I got a fucking gorilla suit on, you know? I mean, I mean you know, what, what am I gonna tell the guy, you know? so. But what happened was, they showed him footage. They took him into the screen room at MGM, showed him this footage, which was all me in the suit, you know. And then they took him to the mill where they're building Big Kong, and it wasn't finished, you know. And they're, I mean, this is how brilliant this is someone's decision was to do this. You know? They show him all this footage, and they go, so well, now we're gonna show you the robot. And the robot is in pieces being built. And he said, 
Well, I want to see the finished robot. I don't care about this unfinished one. I want to see the finished one that did the movie that you just showed me. And they went, um, <laughs> you know, so it eventually came out that Kong was played by this idiot in a gorilla suit. And that's, and I think that's why I got a credit in the movie eventually. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, the film came out, um, I think Michael mentioned it before, uh, 40 years ago, next Saturday. Um, big, big release, lots of merchandise. Uh, if you were a kid in those days, you have some piece of King Kong memorabilia in your closet. I brought one that was my favorite tonight. Um, it's a King Kong Jim Beam bourbon bottle. And the reason that I brought it was that my grandmother bought it for me because she was a fan of bourbon, and I was a fan of Kong. And she said, I'll make you a deal. I'll buy it. I get the bourbon, you get the monkey. So <laughs> I still have it, and it's great. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, if anybody would like to ask one of the group. Uh, right there, sorry. You know, I have no idea how I came up with that name Dino for that <laughs> suit. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it would be funny to call him Dino, yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing is I did an, another movie in an ape suit uh, called The Incredible Shrinking Woman with Charles Grodin again, which was funny. Uh, he only does movies with apes with me in it. You know, so <laughs> Back there. No, not on Planet of the Apes, but I, I did on uh, the Mighty Joe Young that I did uh, at Disney. That was much more the suit that I wanted to build for Kong and much more the performance I wanted Kong to be. Uh, also an incredible shrinking woman and gorillas in the mist. Uh, I had designed the way I wanted to build the suit, again, with the mechanical arm extensions, the quadruped walking ones. And uh, you know, I had you know, this liquid-filled chest, that, so it kind of jiggle and and I wanted the whole suit to be hand-tied, you know, like a hair at a time, uh, ventilated on a, on a spandex fabric so it would be flexible. But uh, I was overruled because Carlo brought, uh, went to Bischoff's taxidermy and bought a bear hide and, and showed it to Dino and said, it's beautiful, you know. And Dino said, it's beautiful. So I said, but it's a bear hide, you know. <laughs> it's like one hide isn't going to make a suit. How many bears are going to die for this suit? And you know, it's not gonna, it's gonna look like a fuzzball when you put it on, you know. And you know, we built this padding, I'd sculpted the body, we ended up fabricating the padding and just using the, the chest from that with the liquid filled things. And when they finally, when Bischoff's, who made the, the first suit, brought it, it took nine hides, nine bears to make one suit, uh, which I was not very fond of the idea of that, but uh, when they put it on, all the, cool, nice, pretty long guard hairs just stood straight up like this because they were bent around in strange forms and it was just this big hair ball, you know. So Carlo got some clippers and just cut off all the beautiful hair and what was left was the, the downier hair that was underneath which was kind of like an off-white kind of tan color. So they ended up spraying my suit with streaks and tips which is a colored hairspray. Uh, so this, you know, beautiful bear hide became this horrible looking thing that they sprayed with streaks and tips. And, and it was scary for me because they would spray it, you know, I'd have this mask on, they'd spray it, you know, before takes. And, the, you know, like in the in the L train sequence where I like throw the train down and this explosions go off, you know, uh, it's like, you know, am I safe with this, you know, uh, this is a suit that's just been sprayed with this hairspray, you know? And the effects guys are going, oh, don't be a baby, you know? And mind you, you know, these guys that are sitting off the explosions had like burn scars and they're missing fingers and shit, you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like, and I could feel the heat, you know, through this much rubber and foam and those things went off. I could feel it. I thought I was on fire, you know? And there's a shot that isn't in the, in the movie, but it was on the, when they released, released it on TV. There's a shot of Kong walking down the Fifth Avenue or something, and he ends up like throwing a car, and the car explodes. And when the car blew up, 
you know, the flames were really close to me, and I like backed up, you know, instinctually, you just try to get out of the way. And and Gillerman said to me, you know, I don't think Kong would do that. And I go, yeah, but Rick Baker would when fucking <laughs> when fire's coming at my face, I move, you know. So, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I was, you know, happy to come out of that movie alive, you know, because the with those scleral lenses when when they fenestrated them all, the the fluid came out, so I had like triple vision. I couldn't see most of the time. And we had shots on, you know, they had miniature World Trade Center in the back lot where they had me standing on the edge of it like this, you know. And it, again, it was about 40 feet tall, you know, and I can't see shit in this, this suit, you know. And, and uh, I said, you know, is there some way that someone could like maybe tie a rope around me and just make sure I don't fall off the edge. <laughs> and, and there were a bunch of things like that where it was like really scary. Like I said, climbing out of this big platform with helicopters coming at you and, and all the things. I, 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 I uh, was so happy to come out alive. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, yes, sir. I know there's a number of uh, some destruction scenes in this city that we did. Uh, I don't remember exactly what else was. Okay. Yeah. There's not a ton missing. There's a few lines here and there. There was the car scene you're talking about is the big one. Kong comes down the street and picks up a car and throws it through a building. That's actually the shot that ended up in Time Magazine. Of, of you know, the, it's a pretty famous shot. Um, but yeah, that's about it. You know, another thing that was really scary besides the fire was the water. You know, when they, they had me crossing the, the river, it, again, it was like this Esther Williams pool, which is pretty deep. And they filled it with water, and they built a, a you know, plywood platform so that, you know, this much of my body when I stood on the platform would, would be uh, uh, you know, out of the water, and the rest would be underwater. But it was like, you know, four-foot platform, and then it was a, like a 30-foot drop, you know. <laughs> And you know, when I first got in the water, I was, I was floating because it was foam. And so they ended up having to squeeze the water into my suit. So the suit was like really very heavy. And I said, well, you know, I can't really see. And if I step off the edge of this, I'm gonna go down to the bottom, you know? And they go, well, it's okay. We have, we have guys down there with uh, you know, scuba divers with a respirator, and I go, there's no way that's gonna get into my mouth, you know? <laughs> you know? So, so I was scared, you know? And also then, you know, there's all these lights, you know, all around, and I just kind of think, you know, this, the wires from the lights are going in the water, is this safe, you know? And, but the hard thing was getting out of the water, you know, which they, they kind of, you see me after I'm out of the water, but there's actually, they had me walking up this ramp and getting out of the water, and the suit must have weighed like 500 pounds because it was just full of water. And I was like struggling and water is just pouring out everywhere, you know. That's why they didn't use it, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> I did, to further your question, I thought of one thing they did cut. It, had a, it originally had a very 1970s ending um, when Jessica Lang is calling to Jeff Bridges. The actual original as shot ending is he looks at her makes a stern look, turns and walks off into the crowd because they could never be together because of what happened. And I think in the previews, they thought it was maybe two, 270s. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they got it out, but um, over there. Seven. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I love Jack Pierce, and I, I mean, I'm such a big makeup geek and effects geek. You know, Willis O'Brien, Ray Harryhausen, all these guys were my idols. And also, one of my idols was a guy named Charlie Gamora, who a lot of people don't know who he is, but he was, you know, what it, it, makeup effects weren't like they are now, you know. And the people that did this stuff were kind of hidden in a back room, and they were called lab men. It was kind of like put down name for these guys, and and they were like the real geniuses. And Charlie Gamora was one of these guys. He was a brilliant sculptor, and he made some of the first ape suits ever in film. He was in in uh, Laurel and Hardy movies. He was in Little Rascals. You know, he was in uh, 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 Phan not Phantom. Of the, well, he was in the Phantom of the Rue Morgue, but also the uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue uh, with Bela Lugosi. And he made a gr some great suits. There's a movie called Monster and the Girl 
that's like one of my all-time favorite gorilla suits, much better than the King Kong suit. And, uh, and it was built you know, in, in the 40s. And this guy, again, was one of my idols. And I'm just a, a product of being a fanboy of all this work that had been done before me and, and loving that stuff. And, and I, it was, I want to do that. I did it as a hobby. And when I found out through the pages of Famous Monsters, someone you mentioned, for Ackerman, you know, that people actually could make a living at doing this. I thought, well, that's what I want to do with my life. And, and I didn't really have a plan B. And fortunately for me, it worked because, uh, you know, I wasn't, it, you know, I was told I, you basically had to be born into the business. I, I went to the makeup union when I was 15 years old uh, with a box of, with heads in it and foam rubber appliances and all these things that I had made. And they told me to give up. I was never going to get in. Uh, that, you know, these jobs were given to people that were born into the business. And, you know, there was a lot of nepotism at the time, you know. Um, and they also said, you know, the kind of work that you wanted to do, which was like the effects makeup stuff, they, they said, you know, these jobs are few and far between. And this is a quote from the business rep of the union to me when I was 15 years old. He said, most of the time, you're just going to be mopping sweat off of some bitchy actress, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I, it just made me that much more determined. I just said, you know, I cannot believe that if I get good at this, that someone is, is not going to hire me, you know. And, and uh, but I didn't have anything to fall back on. I just, thank goodness it, it worked for me. <laughs> so, but yeah, they're, you know, they're the pioneers, you know. And the Willis O'Briens, I mean, before I came tonight, uh, actually when I was eating uh, some dinner, I had uh, Turner Classic Movies on, they were playing the original King Kong, you know, and, and uh, it's a beautiful film. I mean, the jungle stuff in there with the, the, the layered glass paintings and stuff, it was so atmospheric and so incredible, you know. And, and I, like I said, I, I had real mixed feelings about doing Kong uh, because of, of being, again, being a stop motion nut, you know, and, and being such a fan of the original film. And the, you know, the, the attitude on this film was that original film wasn't very good. We're going to make a good film, you know. And I kept saying, you know, you'll be lucky if you make anything half as good as the original King Kong, you know. Uh, and, you know, but that work is, you know, what inspired me to, to, do, to do what I do. And I'm so thankful for all those people that came before me that I, I learned from and from looking at their work and, and critiquing, you know, seeing things that, you know, I wonder why he did it that way, you know. I mean, there were, I didn't realize that you can't always do what you want to do, you know, <laughs> that there are other people involved, you know. A director will have an idea or an actor won't want to wear something, you know. And, you know, there'd be times I'd see makeups that were like, by you know, some of my favorite makeup artists that I didn't think were, as good as some of the other things they've done. And I, after working in industry, I realize now, well, yeah, I'm sure somebody else said, you know, you can't do that. You have to do it this way. You know, so you have to be a biped gorilla instead of a quadruped gorilla, you know, or, or whatever, you know. So. But yeah, thank goodness for Jack Pierce and Dick Smith and John Chambers and William Tuttle and Clay Campbell. And, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on, you know. So. Thank you. A question over there. I kept thinking she should hold her nose in that shot, you know, having a giant, <laughs> a giant ape blowing on her like that. Uh, yeah, that had, that was one of the last hits I sculpted, uh, after the, I sculpted the original head, I did two other head sculptures, uh, one I called the angry head and another one I called a big roar head, which was sculpted with an expression, a big roar, roaring expression. Um, and the, Blowing head. It was. It came about after we started filming, and I couldn't sculpt it. So there was a, a sculptor um, named uh, Magda. I think was her name, if I remember correctly. Who I what I did when I did my heads is uh, after we made the mold of the initial head, I made a master of it, and then we made a, a flexible mold of that master that we could do a clay press out, and then we could use that clay press out to do the other heads. So. Uh, Magda took the uh, clay press out from that mold and did one with a slightly pierced lips, uh, pursed lips, and uh, there were big bladders in the head uh, that were inflated to make the cheeks blow up like that, and and there was a really really cool mechanism that Carlo and his guys did to, to make the lips look like they were pushing out like that, you know. Um, but I can't take credit for that head, uh, you know, other than it was from a, a press out from my head. Uh, but I actually have another funny Kong story. Uh, you know, the big hands, I, I, I supervised the sculpture of the big hands, and they were based on the hands I did for my, my test gorilla suit. 
and um, there was a sculptor named Tom Prosser that sculpted those, and he's a little guy. You know, I mean, I'm not a big man, but to me, he was he was about five foot two, little guy, really good sculptor. They sculpted one big hand. It was uh, kind of a carved foam uh, to a certain point, and then water-based clay put on top of that, and you know, uh, hundreds of pounds of water-based clay. So he had this big hand sculpture, and he had to do, uh, you know, I think he sculpted the right hand, they had to do the left hand next. And they decided they were gonna take a slide of a uh, photograph, you know, for the slide of the right hand, and then project it on a, uh, and, and, and flop the, the thing so they could get the left hand to look exactly like it. And I was in the building where Carlo was working, uh, when, when they decided they were gonna take the slide and we were talking about something about how to m make the suit work and things and they were pushing the hand outside, out the door so that they could get it far enough back to get the photograph and out of the corner of my eye, I, I see this movement and all of a sudden this hand starts to fall and poor little Tom Prosser who sculpted this thing and has worked really hard on it, runs up to it and tries to stop it and you know, probably a thousand pounds of clay, you know, goes bam, and like just flattens him on the ground. Fingers go flying, you know. And uh, it, it took a number of people to get the remains of the hand off of him, and he was unconscious, you know. And uh, so Tom Prosser was Kong's first victim in this movie. <laughs> you know, so to... We'll take one more question right here. Yeah, well, I mean, we talked about it, and we do think it should be toned down a lot. And you know, as I mentioned, I you know I sculpted these three heads, and I'm really sorry I did because the generic head, the first head I sculpted, I think is the best looking one, and it and it did a lot of really good things. And they used the big roar head, I think, way too many times, and the the teeth were never set in the in the in the skull quite right, and the lip is about this far away from the teeth, you know, and it looks really <laughs> weird like that. But that's some of my favorite stuff too. I think that you know the shots of just the eyes going through the uh, you know. Uh, the jungle, and then the, I think that first shot of Kong uh, is one of my favorite shots when he's at the altar there. I think he looks pretty good in that shot. Again, thanks to Dick's and careful lighting of it, you know. Um, but yeah, and I also like the, the sequence in the in the super tanker. Like I said, that's when uh, uh, the other guy was doing the snake fight thing. I was doing that, and it was it was nice to to do the more gentle, you know, calmer kind of stuff instead of just breaking things and roaring all the time. You know? Um, thank you all for coming. We'd like to. We'd like to thank the people who are really responsible for putting this together tonight, starting with Don Mancini, Martha De Laurentiis, all the folks at um, the American Cinema Tech and the Aero Theater who have been really great. Um, and please once again thank the panel: Jack O'Halloran, Richard Klein, Rick Baker, Martha De Laurentiis, and Richard Kraft. Thank you. Thank you.